Hello and welcome everyone. Figuring this out here. Um, all right, people are arriving. It's great to see you. Awesome. Just give like a couple more seconds. There's like lots of people dropping in now. Nice. All right, um, let's get started, hey? Um, hello and welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us today for this three-part webinar series, Relevant Conditions, Relevant Answers. Today is part one, exploring the secrets to truly controlled cell experiments in cancer research. My name is Lisa Bodily, and I will be the host for today. This webinar series is a joint project of three like-minded companies. And it is my pleasure to, uh, to introduce to you today our three speakers. Uh, Shasti Alm, Head of Biology at Face Holographic Imaging. Ali Shehen, the Chief Scientific Officer at Biospherix. And Jake Boy, Senior Application Scientist at Scientific Bioprocessing. Now you can look forward to exciting presentations each about 15 minutes, and it will be followed by a Q&A session at the end of the webinar. So if you have questions, please ask them uh, using the chat function anytime during the webinar, and we will pick it up at the end. So let me introduce to you our first speaker. Our first speaker is Shesti Ann from Face Holographic Imaging. She holds almost 15 years of hands-on experience at PHI, with the Holomonitor live cell imaging and analysis tool. And she is dedicated to finding new ways to extract relevant data from cells without the artifacts caused by traditional way of handling and imaging cells. So please welcome Shasti. And Shasti, I will give you presentation rights. Hi, and thank you everybody. And thank you, Lisa, for that introduction. Can you see my screen? I hope so, yes. Okay, in the next 15 minutes, I will talk to you about why the choice of experiment conditions and the choice of methods are important in cancer research, very shortly, but still. I will also talk about how amazing the PHI Holomonitor works in this, how, how it works, and give you a taste of what results you can get from it. So, big question for cancer research. Why are the experiment conditions important? To start with, usually you talk about the tumor microenvironment. You see it like in this drawing where you have the tumor cells, you have the non-malignant cells, and you have all their cell signals interacting with the tumor. But you also have physiological factors like the oxygen levels, the pH and the temperature. Those are also important for the microenvironment of the tumor. Um, looking at oxygen levels, for example, they vary a lot. In, in some tumors, the oxygen is well below what you find in, in venous blood because there is insufficient vascularization. And due to that deficiency in oxygen, the cells produce lactate, which will shift the pH from 7.4 in some tumors, not in some, and you will have a temperature, which is usually around 37 degrees, but ranges from, from below 37 to somewhat above 37, is normal for a normal person. So, researchers do what they can. We have created a cell-friendly environment in the incubator, where we have the pH regulated, we have the temperature regulated, but we do not have the oxygen regulated as well as it should. It's the same as in the environment around us. But still, this incubator is as good as it gets right now, unless you have a biospherics. Dr. Hem will talk, you about, talk to you about the biospherics um, incubators in about half an hour. Um, but even if we have the incubators, we don't really care too much about the environment still. We open the doors, we look at the results, we take the samples out and study them, and then we put them back again. All we, this will make fluctuating temperature, fluctuating pH, fluctuating everything. 
So um, for all these experimental results that we are after, for them to be relevant, they should be created in the same environment as tumor is. Otherwise, the results are irrelevant for all the human applications. So in this webinar, we'll try to show you alternative experimental setups that will address ways of circumventing these environmental issues. So in addition to this, the methods we use are often also not quite relevant. So why are the methods important? Often, when we want to study drug response, cell growth, cell migration, we use indirect methods. Here I put up an example of the MTT assays or neutral red or APPase assays, but there are more. And they're irrelevant as far as I'm concerned because they're indirect. You want to know the drug response and see the cell number. So what you measure is the activity of the mitochondria when you use the MTT assays. And then you say the activity corresponds directly to the cell number. This is not always um, useful. I try to say it nicely. Um, also, what you get, the data you get out, is the average of all the cells. So you don't know what, what mixture of cells, cell individualities you have. Cells are indivi individuals, individuals, individuals that, just like us. So what can you do instead then? I really want to suggest to use direct methods where you can achieve both single cell and population data. Instead, I suggest direct methods where you have single cell and population data. You know what happens in your cell culture. You get an actual number of cells, you get individual cell reactions. You can even find out if you have subpopulations of cells doing strange stuff. And here in these graphs, you can see cell movement over time. This is an example of where you measure individual cells. So in the graph you see in the left side graph, there are two cells that have moved much, much faster than the others. The graphs are distance over time. And if you had only average results, you would not see these two cells doing strange things. And they might actually throw the results a lot. In, in, in vivo. Okay, so now I'm going to talk a little about us and how we can contribute to make your experiments more cell-friendly and more relevant. We are Face Holographic Imaging, PHI. It's a worldwide company. We have a subsidiary in Boston and we produce this beautiful hollow monitor. It's a live cell imaging system with a software that can quantify many aspects of the daily life of the cell. The holo monitor can be placed inside an incubator. So all the results we get come from cells living their happy life inside the incubator. No opening, closing doors, no moving samples, just the stable temperature inside the incubator. But the holo monitor is even more self-friendly than that. And that's because of the technology we use. It explains much about why. So how does the holo monitor work? How can the holo monitor monitor and quantify the cells? We use digital holographic imaging. You know holographic holography, you can get 3D images out of stuff. And we do that by having very, very low intensity light passing through the cells. And when the light passes a cell, it will be delayed. If the cell is thicker, more dense, the light will be delayed more. Thinner edges, the light will be delayed less. That's what we measure, the delay of the light. And the computer will then, for each pixel in the image, it will calculate how thick is the cell, and then it will make a cell drawing. It looks pretty much like this. So if you look to the left in the image, there is a bar which is white in the top and black in the bottom. That shows the thickness 
So the thicker the cells are in this image, the whiter they are. So the computer will draw a representation of the cells. Every picture I will show you in this presentation is made like that. It's computer generated, reconstructed, based on the data of the delay of the light. We can also make prettier pictures with nice colors, but they're all artificial coloring, just showing the thickness of the cells. In this example, the thin cells are kind of turquoise whitish, while the, no, sorry, the thick cells are turquoise whitish, while the very thin cells are more apricot. So the colors are all just to present the cells in a nicer way. Because we have low light intensity, we have no phototoxicity. Because we measure the delay of the light, we have it's label free. So you take this, you put the instrument inside the incubator, no labels, no phototoxicity, it's cell-friendly. Or even better, you use the Biospheric Ex Vivo systems. So what can we measure using this cell-friendly system? The images I show you here, the left image shows control cells untreated as T0. You can see the color bar that the really thick cells are kind of white yellowish and the very thin cells tend more to be blue. After 48 hours of treatment with colsonid, that's the left bottom, right bottom picture, sorry, you can see that the cells have become much larger. The control cells, that's the top picture after 48 hours, look a bit like the zero hour cells, just many more. So these nice pictures show you that something happened with colsimid treatment. But with the graphs, you can get hard data out and quantify the changes. So in the top graph, you can see the orange markers, they show the control cells at T0, while the blue markers show the control cells at 48 hours. So morphologically wise, with area and thickness, nothing much has happened. In the lower graph, you see the treated cells, the cosmic treated cells. So again, the yellow one are the T0, while the blue ones are 48 hours of treatment. And here you can see that the area has increased a lot during the treatment. Um, there is a publication based on morphology. Uh, Dr. Madaxi et al. They evaluated the effect of 30 drug, drug derivatives and they found four that actually had an anti-tumor efficiency. So they looked at A549 human lung adenocarcinoma cells and they showed that morphology changed. The cells rounded up. You can see that in the pictures, the black and white pictures. The top one is the control, the middle one is um, low concentration, and the lower one is the high concentration of the substances. There is a clear effect on morphology, and in the graphs you can also see it, you get the data out for it. Interestingly, what they show here in the rightmost graphs is the mean for every population. So if you look just at the means, the averages of the populations, you can see that they are well separated and it looks like there will be all cells gathered, control, middle treatment, uh, low treatment and high treatment. But if you look at the scatter plots showing each little dot represents one cell, you can see that in reality, there is an overlap in morphology between the control cells and the treated cells, and between the cells which have been treated less and more, telling us that the cells react differently to the treatment. The mean values do not tell the full story. Another thing we can do with a hollow monitor is the dose response curve. That's standard. People usually use MTT assays to do that. Data is usually collected after 24 or 48 hours. Using the hollow monitor in the incubator, you can collect data all the time, all through the 48 hours. And you get the data for all time points. Looking at the graphs here, you can see that there is a standard dose response graph after 48 hours. That's the way it normally looks. 
Below that, you see a graph showing the cell count. It's a proliferation study. And you can see the confluence as well. And to the right, bottom right, you see a graph showing the mean volume of the cells. That shows the average. If you go deeper, you get the individual data as well. But looking at this mean volume, you can see that the control, that's the bottom squiggly line, which is the darker, the mean volume of the cell doesn't shift much over 48 hours. But if you look at the top graph, you can see that the volume increased tremendously at the very low concentration of etoposid. Etoposid causes a G2 arrest, so this makes sense. You get hard data showing that. But you can also get nice dose response graph over time. This is what happened to the dose response graph over time. You follow it, you can see the timing of your substance effect. There is a publication by Dr. McDassey. It's almost the same pronunciation. I hope I did it correct. There are two different research groups from the other one. They have investigated the effects of resin. I hope I did that correctly too. On HeLa cells, resin is a poison. It inhibits protein synthesis. So what it shows you here is that they, they show three different concentrations and how that affected the confluence of the cells. They actually tested six doses, but these were the relevant to show. So they easily picked up the data for how the drug affected the cells. But what they did in addition was to pick up data, seven other parameters. We actually have about 30 different morphological parameters, but they picked up seven other parameters in the same go. They didn't have to remake the experiment. They didn't have to, to change anything or, or try anything. So what can we do more? We can also follow cells over time. As you can see here, some of the cells, they have colored tails. The tails show how the cells moved over time. And it's, it's following all the time. It's not a discrete time point, but you can actually follow your cells in detail over time. So, Usually, other methods like wound healing, they have more indirect measurements. Here you can actually go in and directly see how much every individual cell moved. You can also get not only a pretty picture, but again, hard data on this. So you get diagrams that show how the cell moved. But also, in addition, you can have the morphology changes for every single cell over time. Or you can get the population averages here again for movement and for, for morphology changes over time. There is a publication by uh, Dr. Chiro Murray and colleagues. They studied 15 different AZT derivatives on MDA and B231 breast cancer cells. And they found that one derivative, the AD2, AD, ADG2E, affected cell movement at doses that were well below anything that affected cell viability. And you can see here to the right, the rightmost graph, it looks like a small concentrated, um, I'm not sure about that word in English, pile of colors. That's the cells moving very, very little. The left graph shows instead a, a, a lot of it look, looks like yarn almost. That's the cell, individual cells movements over time. And in the in the diagram, you see that the cells treated with DMS OS control, they moved much further away from the starting point than the cells treated with ADG2E. The authors think this suggests. ADG2E as a good candidate for inhibiting cancer metastasis because of the low toxicity and the high impact on cell movement, on cancer cell movement. Okay, so that was just a short 
example showing of different things that people have done with the Holo Monitor. You can find much more examples on our web page where we have about 170 publications with different aspects of the Holo Monitor use. But in short, what we can do is more basic things like cell quality control or, or just count your cells or make a proliferation study or uh, just see how all the cells move without details much. Those response essay goes in there too. Or with these, these, these um, essays are aimed to be easy and give quick results. Why we also have the in-depth essays where you can dig in and get out so many details, you can track the individual cells, you get all the hard data out. But you can also get pretty pictures like this, just follow the cells and get an insight into the everyday of the cell life. So these are HeLa cells and they've been imaged for 48 hours, just the way they are in the incubator. You see how they divide and pop and they become more and more. So that was 48 hours of the cell's lives. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Shesti, for highlighting to us why conditions and the cellular microenvironment matter so much in cancer research, and also for introducing PHI's non-invasive and cell-friendly imaging tool for an analyzing living cells, the Holo Monitor. Thank you, Shesti. Uh, next, let me introduce to you Jake Boy from SBI. So Jake has a strong background in cell culture and genetics with research lab experience and at SBI he supports the new product development and testing. And Jake is dedicated to improving the science around cell culturing and helping customers reach their scientific goals. Right? So welcome, Jake. Hello everyone. Thank you for being with us today and Shusty, thank you very much for that presentation. So um, I know we don't have a ton of time, so I'll get started right into it. So my name is Jake, um, and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about optical sensors and why sensing is so important, particularly in cancer research. So just a brief bit about our company. So we're Scientific Bioprocessing. We are a subsidiary of a much older company called Scientific Industries. They've been around since the 50s, and they invented the Vortex Genie, which I'm sure a lot of you have seen in your labs or at least your travels throughout the science world. So, um, and we work with Dr. Govan Rao at UMBC as development partners to sort of move along this optical sensing technology, which really was a bit of an R&D project for many years before we finally took it to the next level and now make it available for scientists to use. So when it comes to sensing, we think there are four things that are just, you know, they're absolute musts. First of all, the sensors have to be reliable and they have to provide real-time monitoring so that you can eventually move to automatic control and closed-loop feedback. They must provide relevant physiological parameters at the cellular level, and this is something really important that we'll talk about more. So where the cells are growing is much different from the rest of the media oftentimes. And the sensors must be economically remarkable, or in other words, inexpensive. So a lot of us are very aware of the FDA and a lot of the regulations that are coming down the pipeline. And really the FDA is just trying to move the biotech space from one giant R&D project to something GMP manufacturing so that we can eventually get these really promising um, treatments and these really promising um, developments into the clinical setting so that we can actually use them to start helping people. Um, and part of this is the PAT initiative. So, this is where the FDA is talking about controlling manufacturing as early as possible in the development phase. And what this looks like in terms of sensing, this is something like having the same sensing system um, throughout your entire design of experiment. So in the smallest vessels like T-flasks, which we'll talk about later, um, all the way up to your manufacturing scale bioreactors, it's really important to standardize the technologies that you're using so that you're not changing in between phases of your development. And this leads me to one of the biggest points. Right now, there's not a great way to address sensing in small devices like tea flasks, petri dishes, shake flasks, and microfluidics devices. Things like Clark electrodes or your standard electrochemical probes, these just do not get the job done. You can't really put them in these small devices. And we all know about this, the issues with offline sensing. So this leads us to optical sensors. So 
this is a, a small bit of data here from Virginia Commonwealth University, and this is using rat chondrocytes in petri dishes growing in CO2 incubators. And here, using optical sensors, the researchers are able to get real-time pH monitoring for the 24-hour duration of this experiment um, in something as small as a petri dish. So again, this is something that's not been possible before, but optical sensors allow this level um, of sensing in these small devices. So introducing our most basic product offering, and, and here you can see how this is called the ID Developers Kit, and this is using optical sensing, uh, and you can see how it fits multi-well plates, shake flasks, evaporating dishes, and tea flasks, um, as well as a multitude of other devices. So this is really a new world where we're opening up um, sensing technology in these devices where previously we could not get sensing. So just a brief bit about optical sensors. I'm sure not a lot of you have heard about them. It's a really, uh, it's a newer technology in terms of it breaking onto the commercial scene. And so what really makes these sensors great and what sets them apart from, from other types um, is, is really how minimally invasive they are, how versatile they are, and how small they can be. Um, so these sensors can be steam sterilized. They can be gamma irradiated. So there's a lot of different applications we can fit using these sterilization methods. Um, and really the most important thing I'd like to point out is that the sensors, they can be really, really tiny. So here, the standard size for them is one centimeter squares and they're 0.3 millimeters tall. So just a couple pieces of paper stacked on top of each other in terms of height. Um, but these sensors can also be as small as three millimeters in diameter. So you can just imagine if you've got three millimeters of space in your bioreactor or your tea flask or any vessel you're growing cells in, you can use these sensors. Um, the sensors are also single use. And like I mentioned before, really inexpensive. So it's much more of a plug and play method. The sensing um, is really easy to do. You don't have to sterilize the sensors afterwards. You just throw them away when you're done. So you're not risking contamination or things like that. So microfluidics devices, and this is a, an area that you know, is just about to take off. And especially in cancer research, there's so much potential here. So things like organ on a chip, they provide us with really, really high throughput at a very low cost. So you can run a lot of experiments um, without really you know, spending a ton of money and a lot of iterations on your design of experiment using these devices. And really probably the best thing about the, the uh, microfluidics world is that you can use human tissue so that when you're doing your research, you're not relying on some animal analog that may not work exactly the same way when you translate that to a human. You're instead using actual human tissue so that you're getting much more physiologically relevant results when you're doing studies like this. And there are three different ways that we like to incorporate our sensors in microfluidics devices. So here we have an organ on a chip set up on the right you can see. And the places that where we would put optical sensors in this system the perfusion lines and the feeding lines that you can see so we can incorporate a flow cell that allows sensing in these lines. We can also put sensors in the media reservoir themselves. So the waste container or the fresh media, we can have sensing in both of these at the same time to compare and contrast. We can also have sensors in the organ on a chip device itself. And that looks just like this. So here we have three millimeter sensors embedded in this organ on a chip. The sensors are the white spots that you see there in the image. And in this case, we're using 10 microliters of fill volume to use these sensors. So, you know, I would challenge you to find any other sensing system that can use this tiny little level of fill volume. That's what really makes optical sensors so great for micro microfluidics. They can be really tiny and you don't require a really big fill volume. So you're still maintaining that laminar flow on that micro level when using these. So now I'll talk about tea flasks. This is something that everybody knows about. And I want to preface this by talking about hypoxia and how this pertains to cancer research. So hypoxia, and we're just learning more and more about this now in the COVID era when oxygen has really come to the forefront of people's research, especially in cell culture. Um, so hypoxia in cancer research, and really any type of research, but this um, in particular, there's a lot of publications that are out there for us to take a look at. And what researchers have found is that under hypoxic conditions, so 1.3% oxygen or less, um, these cancer cells are really altering their metabolism. So if you have a level of oxygen that is unknown to you in something like a tea flask or a petri dish, and you're doing some type of cancer research, maybe using tumor cells or cancer cells, you really don't know what's happening to the metabolism of those cells as they're growing, 
as they're respiring, as they're metabolizing and using up oxygen and becoming hypoxic and anoxic. So it's really important to have sensing um, from the very smallest level all the way up so you really know what your cells are up to. And here's a study done. Um, and this study is, you know, putting T flasks to the test. And we use T flasks because they have a really nice surface area to volume ratio. There's a lot of space for, presumably, gas to diffuse through that liquid layer to get down to the cells as they're using up oxygen. So it's, you know, the, the school of thought is that T flasks provide enough oxygen for cells to grow. And people put T flasks in CO2 incubators. And CO2 incubators have a very specific gas environment. They have 5% CO2 and between 18 and 19% oxygen. Why do we do this? Well, so that the cells can have 18 to 19% oxygen throughout cell culture and so that the 5% CO2 can interact with the buffered cell culture media to keep physiologically relevant levels of pH. But you, this was just a convenient assumption that people make when they use T-flasks. These researchers equip T-flasks with optical sensors to put it to the test to see if this is what's really happening with their cell cultures. And what we see here is a comparison that, you know, people have done this for a long time. They think if you crack the lid of the T-flask, it will allow the environment to get in and feed the cells the correct amount of oxygen and provide the right gas environment. This study right here shows that this does not work. Using optical sensors, the researchers using two T225 flasks were able to test a closed T flask and a partially open T flask. And alarmingly, you can see that at between two and three days of these adherent cells growing, they had become anoxic. There is no oxygen left for these cells to use. And this is really important when you think about that last slide that we showed where cancer cells around this anoxic hypoxic level change their metabolism and this is documented. So just imagine what your cells are doing that you don't know about when you're growing them in T flask sitting in CO2 incubators. And what the researchers determined is that the T flask just like any other static culture device is mass transfer limited. This means that the liquid layer acts as an insulator that does not allow the gas phase to get down to where the cells are actually growing. So to combat this, they propose a means of gentle agitation to break up that insulating layer and allow that oxygen to actually get down to the cells. They designed a rocking platform, which you can see here on the right. This study is using T75 flasks on a rocker platform in a CO2 incubator. You can see the static flask sitting there and then the one on the rocking platform in the same incubator, so all the same conditions. And they just gently agitate this media in the rocking T flask in order to see. Uh, and using optical sensors, they're taking a look at what's happening to the pH and the oxygen in these two flasks as they're growing. This data is really astounding. So here we see figure C and D, and we'll dive more into those here. This is figure D. This is looking at the pH in the rocking compared to the static T75 flask during this experiment. So in red, we have the rocking T flask. In black, we have the static T flask. And what's really, really important to note here is that the physiologically relevant level of pH was better maintained in that rocking flask. The reason for this is because CO2 is heavy. And as cells are using up oxygen and respiring, they, they give off CO2, which eventually sits on top of the cells. This lowers the pH because CO2 is acidic, and it also starves the cells of oxygen. So in order to combat this, and you can see the results in the static flask, how pH dropped to dangerously low levels and what that might be doing to the phenotype and ultimately the genotype of your cells. Um, and in the rocking flask, that CO2 layer that sits on top of the cells is more diluted and broken up as the media washes back and forth. And you can see that you know, greater levels of physiological pH were maintained. Another important thing here, because the cells are healthier and happier in that rocking flask, there was a 31% higher antibody titer in the rocking flask. Here's figure C. This is the same as the last, except looking in at oxygen instead of pH. So again, the black line is the static flask. And you can see that after, again, two or three days, the cells are becoming completely devoid of oxygen. There is no oxygen left for them. It's not healthy. Who knows what this is doing to the, ways your cell, to the way your cells behave? Um, we look at the rocking T flask there in red, and we can see that the level of oxygen is maintained throughout the entirety of the experiment. So it never dips to these low, dangerous, hypoxic, and anoxic levels. And I really hope that this data 
is getting those gears turning in your minds, thinking about, oh my goodness, I'm growing cells in my Petri dishes or my tea flask sitting there statically in my CO2 incubator. What's really going on with those cells that I have not known about up to this point? So now a little bit about our technology. So really what this is about is when you have all the sensing, what do we do with it? And how does optical sensing really work? So this is called the ID reader. This device is the one that basically it sends light through the wall of a culture vessel to fluoresce off these sensor patches that ultimately does the sensing. This device has a lot of nice features. Um, there are two channels for sensing. So you can have two channels of dissolved oxygen, two channels of pH, or one of each. And you can configure this with one click on the software. This is meant to be sterilized and put into an incubator to grow, or as your cells are growing, this can sit underneath something like a tea flask. And this diagram here helps us understand it a little bit better. So in the yellow, we see a vessel. It has some protons floating around, some oxygen molecules floating around. And we can see the beam of light that's coming up from the reader. It travels through the wall of the culture vessel. The sensor patch is adhered to the bottom of this vessel. Now, this sensor, the, the optical sensors have no connection to the outside world. Once they're enclosed in a vessel, that's it. It's closed off. That you don't have to open the vessel ever again. There are no wires running out of it. It's just this tiny little spot, three millimeter spot that sits in a culture vessel. The light travels from the reader through the wall of the culture vessel. The sensor patch fluoresces and returns a signal, a certain wavelength of light. And depending on the difference between those wavelengths of light, you get a reading on dissolved oxygen or pH. If the form factor of the standard reader does not work for you, if you're a bioreactor company, for example, we have fiber optic enable kits. In ways that we like to use this, so we have a probe that we can insert fiber optic cables into. Now, this probe has the exact same geometry um, as something like an electrochemical probe that if you have port space in your bioreactor, this probe will fit. And the best part about it is that, you know, we know that port space is really, really valuable. So with this one single probe, you can get pH, dissolved oxygen, and temperature sensing. So three types of sensing with just one, you know, one probe size amount of space, and it's really an upgrade um, in terms of using a bioreactor with this system. We also have the external adapter. So this is meant to stick to the side of any type of vessel. So let's say, for example, you want to have a sensor on the wall of your culture vessel, and you choose some space on the wall, you attach this adapter to it, and you can run a fiber optic cable, as you see in the image, directly to that to get sensing anywhere you want in your vessel. Next, we have the flow cell, which I mentioned a little before. This is meant to integrate into something like perfusion or feeding lines and provide sensing, you know, as the media is traveling to or from the bioreactor or whatever cell culture system you might be using, like microfluidics, like I mentioned before. Also, environmental control. So we spoke about a rocking platform. So we also offer a rocker that is meant to go inside of your incubator and fix that problem of these you know, these cells that are being starved of oxygen as this thing rocks back and forth and agitates the tea flasks. We also have instrumented shake flasks. So a lot of people use shakers, obviously, to grow their cells. And we can equip these shake flasks now with, with dissolved oxygen and pH sensors. We also offer a suite of software. It provides data logging. It provides real-time data and interactive graphs that show you what's happening in real time. And we can get scans as quickly as every 10 seconds. So every 10 seconds, you can be updated on what your cells are experiencing in terms of dissolved oxygen and pH. And we know that there are a lot of metabolites that people are interested in. So we have glucose, lactate, glutamine, and CO2 all coming in the near future. So with that, I want to thank everyone. Oh, here's the bibliography, by the way. If anyone wants the presentation or to check out this bibliography afterwards, feel free to contact us. I think these presentations will be available after this if you want to check it out. So with that, you know, uh, I want to thank everyone for being here. I want you all to use your imagination, use this new information, and imagine the world that's possible with this type of sensing available to you. Thanks, Jane, for sharing your insights and all the examples you gave us. And yes, this uh, live webinar will be rec is recorded, and you all will get the recording afterwards. Um, Jake, actually, your talk showed me like how important real time monitoring of cellular conditions is, uh, especially when it became to pH and dissolved oxygens. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's quite the topic. I want to thank you again for introducing SBI sensor technologies and instruments to everyone who has joined today. Well, let's make our experiment cell culture conditions more reproducible, right? So speaking about reproducibility, um, let's switch over to our third speaker, Alicia.
I want to just quickly introduce Alicia to you. She is the Chief Scientific Officer at Biospherics, and she has crafted Biospherics's first scientific program, collaborating with scientists worldwide to advance cell-based therapies and research. But also, Alicia is dedicated to promoting in vitro reproducibility and enhancing clonable, aseptic, and physiological relevant cell production environments for better scientific reproducibility and translatability. So, Alicia, welcome. Thank you, Lisa. At Biospherics, we build everything from a cytocentric point of view. And to describe this to you, I'm going to start with a short mental vacation. We're going to use our imagination here, just like we did with Jake. Now, my dad was a, a school teacher in the inner city for 37 years, and one of his favorite projects was called My Private Island, in which the students had to build a three-dimensional model of an island, put their favorite animal on it, plan out all the environmental supports for the animal, the water cycle, the flora, the fauna, design the balance there between all the systems. So I'm going to have us do this here just uh, for a moment. And so close your eyes for a moment, take a deep breath and build your own private island. Now, do you have a mountain on there? Do you have a river surrounded with ocean to isolate it from everything outside? Make a place for yourself to stand on your island. What are you standing on? Are you standing on the top of the mountain and it's rocky? Are you standing on a beach? where you can feel the warm sand under your feet? Are you standing on a thick bed of pine needles? Take a deep breath, what do you smell? Now picture your favorite animal, you know, a polar bear, or a river dolphin, a parrot. Give your island a latitude and longitude for the right climate. You know, does your animal need altitude to soar from? Do you need lush tropical forests? What's the food chain you need for that animal? What are the right conditions for that animal there? Now open your eyes, come back to me, come back to me. Um, did your latitude and longitude, did the climate of your island change between the time that you were standing there with an environment that is perfect for you and in the climate that your animal needed, the perfect environment for them? What if you used an uh, animal that is particularly suited to a people-centric environment? So now I'm gonna ask you, what if you could design the perfect environment for any cells in your lab? What, what would you surround that, those cells with to support their needs? You know, have all your tools on a private island for your cells, everything that you need as well. Isolate it from all the variation from anywhere else. Now, a lot of people start with this kind of image. It's a traditional cell culture incubator. And I'm going to make the case that this is actually designed for the needs of people and not the needs of the cells that are actually in there. I mean, because it's easy to get your hands in there. You can get your face right in there. But if you think about it, I mean, there's that water pan in the bottom that's always contaminated and poses a contamination risk to your cells. The oxygen in here is all wrong. It's way too high for the oxygen levels that cells, even normal cells, experience inside our body. And the CO2 is there, but only as long as the door is shut. Every time you open the door, the CO2 goes off, the pH goes off, whether it's you accessing your cells or whether it's someone else in the lab accessing theirs. So this is essentially people-centric incubation. This is not cytocentric incubation. This isn't the best environment for your cells. These conditions are irrelevant for your cells. So at Biospherics, we build cytocentric incubation, where incubators open only into a controlled cell handling space, where you have full-time relevant conditions for the cells. So the atmosphere is at 37 degrees. That atmosphere can be composed with 5% CO2, so the cells are never out of optimum. You can have physiologically relevant oxygen, so the cells are never out of optimum. Now, in traditional cell handling conditions, not only is the oxygen 
far too high, it's super physiologic. The CO2 is basically not there. And now the cells are cold. And this is at the point at which they're most likely to get contaminated. This is where contaminated risk contamination risks are the highest. Now, these are completely irrelevant conditions for what your cells need, but it's very convenient for people. Cytocentric cell handling, you have full-time, perfect conditions for your cells, the perfect private island for what your cells need. Even the floor is warm to 37 degrees, so the cells never get cold. And you can put all the tools inside that you need for cell analysis or for taking care of those cells, whether it's microscopes or cell sorter or any kind of cell analysis equipment. This is the incusite or a seahorse. You have full-time relevant conditions no matter what you need for the cells. More broadly, the ex vivo system can protect an entire process start to finish. So your cells come into the lab, they go straight into the ex vivo system, and they stay there for as long as you need them till you have what you need, your data. Inside the atmosphere all comes from tanked, filtered, medical grade gases. There's no dirty room air. So you can set it for physiologically relevant oxygen levels, no matter what that level is. And when we start talking about different oxygen levels for cells, now we get into what I call the three L's of physiology, right? Location, location, location. Because even in the parts of the body where you experience the highest levels of oxygen, which would be the lungs, the air that in you inhale is already mixing with air that you exhale. So that oxygen level is about half of what you would find in room air which makes room air conditions irrelevant, even for working with lung cells. And by the time you get down into the tissues, especially tumor tissues, you have profoundly low oxygen levels that, that are relevant for that cell type. Tumors, especially, you know, hypoxia is a major issue. You have high competition for any oxygen that's at the center of a tumor, and you may have very poor vascularity, so you have low delivery. Also, growing tumors can impinge upon uh, neighboring tissues, which can impede blood flow there. So it's, it's really important to uh, place the cell model that you're working on in the proper oxygen conditions. Now, I have a lot of people that say, you know, that's okay. I know a guy down the hall that has an old tri-gas incubator nobody's using because he uses too much gas. I can just run my cells down there from my lab, take care, care of them real quick, run them right back. It takes a few minutes for the gases to charge back up after I close the incubator door, but that's all. I put a piece of tape across it with death threats should anyone open it during the middle of the experiment because that would ruin everything. But it's okay, I'm really quick and the cells spend the vast majority of their time at the right oxygen level. That's good enough. Well, that might be what you see from the people-centric point of view, but I'm gonna show you what your cells actually experience from the cells point of view. This is data that we generated showing what happens at the pericellular oxygen level. This is in the medium when cells are subjected to a quick medium change in room air oxygen. It takes almost two hours for those cells to get back to 3% oxygen after a quick room air medium change. And it takes almost three hours for the intracellular oxygen to get back to 3% oxygen. And the inset here, these graphs are what happens to these cells when they have full-time control of the conditions. And you can see that they have full-time optimal conditions. It never changes for them. They're never out of optimum for that long. And when they're out of optimum for hours, this is an eternity. Now, the Nobel Prize um, last year went to the researchers that first discovered HIF-1-alpha. And I'm just gonna show you some early data from one of the papers on HIF-1-alpha. Here you can see, I just wanna show you the time scale on these figures. We're looking at single minutes for HIF-1-alpha to be modulated in response to oxygen changes. So when you have your cells out of optimum for two to three hours after a quick room air medium change, this is an eternity on the HIF-1-alpha timescale. And downstream of HIF-1-alpha are all these critical signaling transduction pathways, that a lot of which were elucidated uh, by cancer researchers. We're talking about P53, we're talking about MAP kinase, we're talking about NOTCH, we're talking about VEGF, we're talking about CMYK. All of these uh, have cross-signaling with 
HIF-1 alpha, and they impact critical cell processes like metabolism, angiogenesis, differentiation, cell death. All of these are critical to discovering new modalities for treating tumors. This forms the molecular mechanism that underlies my assertion here that controlled cell handling is better for cell-based science. I have over 3,000 customer publications that back me up. Uh, here are a few just from this year, just a few recent ones. This one shows that physiologic oxygen changes P53 signaling and alters cellular processes. This one shows that uh, having hypoxia in the tumor microenvironment changes tumor initiation and progression. This one shows that oxygen levels influence tumor metastatic mechanisms like intravasation. And now our customers are using controlled oxygen to better simulate the tumor microenvironment, like this one that looks at 3D tumor stroma, tumor stroma co-cultures. Um, we also have customers that are developing new therapies targeted at the conditions found in vivo, not in room air. These are the relevant conditions that we need to be working in. So with compartmentalization of the cell culture environment in the ex vivo system, you can have multiple parallel environments, separate islands, separate relevant conditions for your model. This is an ex vivo I have in my lab that I set up for our experiments, and I can have six different oxygen levels at the same time to do range finding experiments. And the cells never have to suffer variable conditions because I can set the cell processing chamber to match any one of these incubators before I open the door. And the cells never know they're out of the incubator. In your lab, you could also use it to separate, say, users. So nobody interrupts anyone else's experiments by opening up the door and creating variable conditions. Separate islands, all relevant. So, now, control conditions for hypoxia and physioxia can really drive cancer research. But what about other variables? Let's talk about temperature for a minute, because you can have unbroken temperature conditions for cells here as well. Now, we've known about edge effect since the 96 well plate was popularized back in the 1970s. Cells settle non-randomly, and you can see this effect around the edge of this plate here where cells are settling more around the very edges of these edge wells around the plate. It even affects some wells on the next row in, you can see here, and there's, there's four wells in the middle of these plates that had no cells, so they look blank. This happens when you plate cells at room temperature and then put them in a 37 degree incubator. And if, um, so what people will do generally is they will put buffer in the wells around the edge of the plate and just not use those wells in their assays. So they're losing 38% of the turf in their experiment. This is a tremendous waste of plastic and materials oh, and time when you think about it, but the thousands of plates being in used every day across the world. It's just a tremendous waste. So people have also tried using plates with moats around the outside, um, but you can see that this is really an effect uh, that's thermally driven. It's driven by convection currents that are set up in the wells that roll the cells across the bottom of the well as these plates are warming up after they go back in the incubator after being plated at room temperature. And we were able to show this um, in a project that we did in conjunction with PHI with their HOLA monitor M4. You can see it here inside one of our ex vivos. And here you can see with their cell tracking that in well E12, this is on the right hand edge of the plate, in a plate that was all the cells were plated in room temperature and then we put the plate in uh, 37 degrees and you can see these cells roll all the way across the well and they would be piling up on the edge of this well then if they were left there and this is a combined vector of all of those cell tracks and you can see we have a very strong uh, roll to the right here when you plate those cells at 37 degrees in a temperature controlled cell processing space, and then of course put them at 37 degrees, what happens is they settle straight down and you get a cell track that averages out to near the origin because you just have small random movements instead of the strong rolling across the cells driven by these thermal currents. 
And you can get rid of most of this edge effect just by plating your cells at 37 degrees. And we're also able to show that this variability starts in the first 10 minutes in the incubator. So um, if this is the difference, again, between plating at room temperature and putting it 37 degrees, you can see all this variability introduced in the first 10 minutes. And after once they've settled, then that variability is fixed there. You're never going to get rid of it again. Whereas if you plate at 37 degrees, you never have this variability introduced in the first place. So if you think about it, even in the most advanced cell culture labs out there in the world, even the cleanest clean room that you can think of it, the pinnacle of cell culture, cell production, you still have the same basic sources of variation that plague the rudest, most crudest cell culture labs anywhere in the world. Every time you open up this incubator door, the CO2 changes, the pH level changes, the temperature changes, the oxygen changes. And it's even worse for cells in clean rooms because see all the layers these people wear? They keep these rooms cold because of all the layers the people have to wear, which makes this essentially a people-centric environment, not cytocentric at all, and the worst place in the world you can put your cells. In a full-time cytocentric environment, you have full-time optimal conditions, full-time relevant conditions for the cells. Now you can take that environment once you've dialed down the perfect environment for what you want for your experiments and you can clone it and you can put it anywhere in the world. So now I can have verifiably the same conditions for cells in San Diego or in Stockholm or in Shanghai or on a ship at sea. It doesn't matter because inside the ex vivo, inside this private island, you have the perfect conditions for your cells. So when we talk about scientific reproducibility, we often talk about things like reagent issues. We talk about things like record keeping. We talk about reporting issues. We talk about cell identity. And all of these factors can add variability to your experiments, whether it's someone in your same lab trying to reproduce your experiments, whether it's a collaborator down the hall trying to reproduce your experiments, or whether it's someone halfway around the world trying to pick to um, pick up a paper and read it and reproduce your experiments. And they all come into effect to different extents. But the one factor that can add variability to every single cell-based experiment done on planet Earth is cell conditions. And this is something that has to be considered every time we bring out scientific reproducibility and try to do something about it. We have to control cell conditions. So, you know, you can't figure out how to save the rainforest by plunking a monkey down in the middle of Manhattan. It's an irrelevant environment. You have to have the proper conditions for yourselves if you're going to have anything that's reproducible, anything that's translatable. So I'm going to stop here and say um, that while we've collaborated uh, with PHI, and we really enjoy combining our technologies with them. We've just started a collaboration with SBI with their ID Rocker, and we're very much looking forward to doing some projects with them combining our technology, putting the relevant tools in the relevant environment for relevant answers. And I'll stop here and take your questions. Uh, if I put it back to you, Lisa. Thank you. Thank you, Alicia, for this final talk today, letting us really feel Biospherics' dedication to design and build cytocentric equipment for cell labs around the world, and for visualizing to us once again the importance of relevant and controlled conditions in our experiment setup and in cell culturing. This brings us now to the end of this first webinar in a series on new technologies that reduce artifacts increase reproducibility and increase translatability of in vitro findings for a world that is looking to cell-based science for the right answers right now. As we're a little bit short on time, I would say let's just pick a question each for each of our speakers. I'll just start with Jesse. I'm using in my lab an MTT assay to assess cell count. And you said that you can directly measure cell proliferation, like for some of the different drug treatments. How does that compare to MTT assay? Mm 
Yes, I heard your question and I'm sorry that you couldn't hear me talking beautifully about the answer. <laughs> um, thing is, it depends a bit on the action of your drug because the MTTS, I will measure the mitochondrial activity for many drugs that will actually correspond to the number of cells. But for some drugs that will maybe increase cell size, for example, you have an increased cell size, but the same number of cells, you will still have an increase in, in mitochondrial activity, but you will not have an increase in cell number. The holo monitor will measure the cell number. But as you can also get data saying that your cells increase in size, you will actually get more data out from the holo, from a holo monitor than from your MPT assay. I'm not okay. sure if that's a sufficient answer, but if, if you need more information, just keep chatting in the chat. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for that. Um, I just have got a question here for Alicia. Alicia, are you ready? Yeah. Um, yeah. So you talked about your private islands, and this question here is targeted at the size of your island. So what if, if I don't have the space for a big system in my lab? Oh, excellent question. Well, we do have smaller systems that we can try to fit into whatever space that you have. Um, and if you just want to start with the incubation piece, we have very small uh, chambers that you can fit into an existing uh, CO2 incubator. <coughs> excuse me, to better control the environment that you have there. So let us know what your needs are and we can try to find something that will fit your space. All right, so islands in every size. <laughs> awesome. Um, all right, Jake. Um, yeah, this one is for you, Jake. Um, how do you recommend we monitor pH and oxygen in our tissue culture flasks. We usually have about 10 to 15 in each incubator at a time. Do we need sensors in each flask? Right, back? that's a great question. Yeah, uh, so typically, you know, T flasks are made for stacking. They have little lips on the bottom of them that allow you to put them one on top of the other. So that's how they're meant to be used. Um, and so what we recommend in a situation like this, if you're going to be growing your cells in static T flasks, a bunch of them in the incubator at the same time, you can do sensing on just a couple of those flasks and use them as what we call sentinel T flasks. So if you have all the same cell types growing in all the same conditions, in all the same types of vessels, then you can hope that the sensing in one of those flasks will be representative of what the rest of them are experiencing. So in, in a perfect world, of course, we'd want sensing in every flask, but in a situation like this, if that's you know the capability of your lab, then you want to have sensing in at least a couple of those to give you an idea of what's going on in the rest of them. Thanks, Jake, for that. Um, I think we just wrap up here, and everyone, like, thank you for your questions, and we will get back to you via email just right after this webinar. By the way, each speaker has actually prepared a handout for you guys, which you are able to download here. So this brings us to the end. And um, so thank you for all your questions. Thank you for listening. And so I just want to remind you that this was the first webinar in our series. So we have two more coming up. Let me just pull up the schedule here for you. Next one on October 28th, we're going to highlight um, more special to stem cell research why relevant conditions matter to get relevant answers if you want to uh, register for that the registration will open soon so just follow us on our social media channels to stay up to date and so thank you for today to all our amazing speakers and thank you all for joining us <laughs> thanks everyone thank you